All right, here we go. Can you hear us okay, Leslie? I can hear you fine. Sweet. All right. Oh. You gotta remember, camera's facing the audience, so I'm gonna come out here so you don't see my backside, Leslie. These guys do, but you know, that's, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, and you've got slides for me? Sweet. I do. All right, and we've got a few people online. Looks like we got 12, give or take. Um, but it is good to see everyone out, uh, both here in the audience and people that are virtual. So we've got a uh, we've got a great night planned. We've got Leslie Brooks, who is the BDD coach. He's going to be talking about behavior-driven design and testing and how that all works out and why you want to do that in your day-to-day -day job and why that's important. Next. All right. Of course, we'd like to thank our sponsors. For those that are here locally or that want to be here locally, we do sponsor pizza and we've got some swag stuff from Tech Systems. We can show some of this. Now, again, um, those that, that are here, so we've got some drones. We'll show the, show the people out there. So we've got some drones uh, sponsored by Tech Systems. We'll raffle those off. And we also have uh, some JetBrains licenses, a Vencat Supermillion um, Agile Learner subscription, and I think that's it. I think that's what we've got for tonight. So if you're interested in any of those door prizes, um, we will get to that at the end. Um, those that want the drones, actually, you know what? If you're here, you can win one of the prizes. Um, we're not shipping the drones though, so those are going out to people that are here locally. Congratulations, all, what, like 10 of us? May the odds be forever in your favor. And those people that are virtual, you could also win, or not also, but you could win one of the JetBrains licenses or the Vencat uh, year subscription to his website as well. Uh, so we've got Goldman Sachs is another, um, another sponsor. Let's just roll through the sponsors. JFrog, I don't think we've got any of the JFrog people here with us. I don't think Ari's with us tonight. Uh, Lucid, of course, definitely we want to thank Lucid for allowing us to use their building and also their Zoom account and what else? Employees, um, <laughs> anything else that we that we are able to use from Lucid is great. Master Control and Overstock. I think they came back, didn't they? They weren't with us last, were they with us last month as a sponsor? Yeah, so uh, Overstock came back as a sponsor, which is great to have them. Um, Apple Tools, I think they're new as well. Is that our last one? All right, yes. that's our last slide. Yep. Sweet. All right then. Um, so the way this will work, if you've got questions online, do we have that enabled? Can they raise hands? Uh, should be able to. I'll double check. Okay. Uh, if you have questions online, just raise your hand. We'll get those out. Um, Leslie, do you want to handle questions as they come, or do you want people to hold them until the end? I would be happy to take them as they come. Okay, perfect. And for those that are here locally, if you've got questions, you know, just raise your hand, whatever, I'll run over and we will hand over the mic and you guys can ask questions. Sound good? Perfect. All right. Well then, Leslie, we will turn it over to you and you should be able to share screen and we'll get this show on the road. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So... This is titled, Do You Want to Save $50,000 Per Developer Per Year? And the reason for that is a typical developer spends 30 to 40% of their time fixing bugs. I have never had anyone tell me, oh, that's, that's crazy. The developers don't spend that much time fixing bugs. I think everyone looks at that and goes, yeah, that's probably right. And if a developer costs on average, 150,000 per year with benefits, then 30% of their time is worth $50,000 per year. So we can do that and we can save $50,000 per year. All we have to do is eliminate the bugs. And I'm gonna honestly tell you um, how we can do that. And, and you're going to say, Dude, you are from a neighboring state because you're smoking some really good stuff. But I'm going to show you examples of people who've done it, and I'm going to explain how they did it. First up, 
there are, I like to talk about two different kinds of bugs. There are little b bugs. Little b bugs are the ones where the code doesn't do what the developers intended. So off by one, the text entry box isn't big enough for the data. The database field isn't the right type. Um, they forgot to add shipping charges, things of that nature. Those may be difficult to find. They may take a while to find even in the field. They're generally not terribly difficult to fix. Big B bugs, on the other hand, big B bugs are the ones where the code does exactly what the developer intended. It's just not what the customer wanted. And those can cost real money. Your entire development team may have spent two or three sprints writing really good, clean, high quality code that you can now throw away because it doesn't do what the product owner wanted. And those generally don't take very long to find. You, you release the product and, you know, the next day the, uh, the custo customer comes back and <laughs> says, what is this? This isn't what I wanted. But they can be very expensive to fix. Specification by example is a development methodology that is, that is designed and documented to eliminate bugs. Here's the problem. This is what the customer wants. And frequently, the, the product owner and the business analyst get together and write the requirements. And then they throw those over the wall to the developers. And this is what the developers think the customer wants. And the QA team gets involved and they read the same requirements and this is what they think the customer wants. And everywhere those blue and green circles don't overlap is a place where the developers don't understand what the customer wants. And it's a place where the developers can create big B bugs. And every place where the blue and the yellow circles don't overlap, it's an opportunity for little b bugs because the testers aren't testing the product correctly. And I know you have all seen this problem many times, many different companies. It's pervasive in the industry. Specification by example, or BDD, Behavior Driven Development, is designed to get those circles to overlap so that we have a common understanding. We create a common understanding of what it is the customer wants and what we're going to deliver. So that what the customer wants is what is developed and is what is tested and is what is delivered. Specification by example is a better name for BDD, behavior-driven development. Behavior-driven development doesn't tell us what we're doing, but whatever it is we're doing, it's the developers who are doing it. And specification by example says that we are writing requirements with examples. Business analysts and product owners write requirements. So specification by example says we're involving the business analysts and product owners in this development methodology. It starts with the requirements. And that is exactly what specification by example and BDD says we're supposed to do. We're supposed to create a common understanding by working collaboratively with the product owner, customer, and business analysts. So let's look at what it has been documented. Oh, and we're also going to mention TDD, test-driven development. But let's look at what this has been documented to do. At BNP Paribas, a big French bank, the developers were spending 30 to 40% of their time fixing bugs. They had careful 
records. They were tracking what they spent their time doing. And Simon Powers went in as a consultant and introduced specification by example and TDD. BNP Paribus was already agile. So he introduced these two new methodologies. Nine months later, the developers were spending one to 2% of their time fixing bugs. So specification by example, isn't magic. It's not take a three-day class and become an expert. It takes time and practice and discipline. And it's a whole team methodology. At Vanguard Financial, they had been agile for quite a number of years. They introduced specification by example and microservices at about the same time. And their IT department, when I spoke to them, uh, was about 4,000 people. So it takes time to roll out that significant a methodology change across that large an organization. But three years later, they had reduced defects across all of IT by 40%. And some teams had essentially eliminated defects. It's going to take you three years to train and coach that large a change across an IT department that large. So at the end of three years, you would have some teams that had been using specification by example for three years and some for three months. But across the entire organization, they cut defects by 40% and, uh, you know, similar uh, cutbacks in time to deliver features, um, in the amount of time required in testing. Uh, they had a lot of improvements. At Raytheon Technologies, I introduced specification by example in a data science group. And over a one year period, those teams delivered two bugs into production. And everyone agreed they weren't in the requirements, but the developers said, yes, but we should have known that that was a requirement. So we're gonna count it as a bug. And I'm like, I won't knock it, you know, hey, go ahead. That's an admirable attitude. At General Motors, I introduced specification by example in a QA team. They were using eight automation engineers for one website. One year later, they were using one half of an automation engineer to do the same job, plus one manual QA tester to run the tests. And instead of delivering the updates, one release behind the developers, they were delivering the updates two or three days after the developers put the code into an integrated environment. So radically different, um, <clears throat> different outcomes there. So how can it possibly do that? Well, it's not a tool, it's a methodology. Uh, if you change tools, you can conceivably get a five to 10% improvement in whatever metric it is that this tool helps you with, but not a 30 or 40% improvement. So it's not a tool. It's a methodology. It is a systemic change. It's not just a new way to do QA. It's a paradigm shift. Waterfall to Agile was a paradigm shift. You had to change the way you thought about the development process. And specification by example, done right, is a paradigm shift. You're, you've got to change the way you think about a lot of things. It significantly changes your entire process. You throw out throw away some things that you thought were absolutely essential. You just never dreamed that you would do software development without them. Like you'd never dreamed that you would do software development without a four inch thick 
complete final requirements document. Well, that's, that's way out of date these days. It shortens some of your existing processes. So for example, here's a typical development process, simplified, but you write requirements, the QA team starts writing test cases, the developers start writing code, those things come together after they have executed the test cases and proven that they are correct, you start automating. And here's an SBE development process. You write requirements together and the QA team starts automating those requirements the same day the developers start writing the code. And the QA team then delivers those automated tests to the developers before the developers finish writing the code. And, and the QA team doesn't run the tests, the developers do. So in a well-run specification by example development process, we are consistently every sprint delivering the automated tests to the developers, regression tests and new functionality tests before the developers finish writing the code. The, the only thing manual tests should be used for would be for things that automation can't easily test. Visual verification of the UI, are the colors correct? Does it fit properly on all of the cell phones that we support? Things of that nature. Here is a typical simplified defect life cycle. You write the code, you merge the code, you run the tests, the QA team writes a defect, the developers say that's not a defect, the QA team says yes we're going to go back to the product owner and prove it's a defect and, and you go round and round and code gets delivered after all of the bugs have been fixed or perhaps more realistically, after the developers announce that they are losing the will to live and the product owner decides, okay, well, we better accept some bugs and defer fixing them until later because otherwise bad things happen. And here's an SBE defect life cycle. There's no defect life cycle. A team using specification by example doesn't need a defect life cycle. The developers are running all the tests on every build. If one of the tests fails, the developer fixes the bug right there. In the teams I worked with, the developer didn't open a pull request until all of the tests passed. So is there any value in tracking a defect that never makes it to the QA team? If your bugs have life expectancy measured in hours, you know, in, in rare instances overnight, then why would you even bother to track them? Document flow. A traditional development project requires a lot of documentation. Requires Leslie, I've got a question. Yes, real quick. go right ahead. Uh, if, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go back. So when when you're talking about uh, the the code is written and the tests are run, is that running tests locally that developers are doing, or is that in like a CI CD pipeline that, that's going, or both? Both. So if you have a if you if you have it set up where the developers can either run on their own machine, or they can spin up a virtual environment in the cloud, a Docker image or whatever, and run tests there, then they go ahead and run them before they open the pull request. So then your reviews of pull requests are not about, does the code do the right thing? Your reviews are, is it high quality code? Do you have good method names, good variable names? You know, does the inheritance hierarchy make good sense? Those sorts of things. Not does it work? Well, we got another question. Okay. So on the automate requirements mm -hmm. 
phase. Yep. Who is QAing the automated requirements? So things are being written to pass off to developers, implement in the CI CD pipeline. But if the automated requirements weren't correct, that's a problem. So who is QAing the automated requirements as they are being written and implemented to pass down the chain? We'll get to that in a few slides. Great, Great. question. Thanks. I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> Good work, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Yep. Multiple documents. You've got requirements documents. The developers then create architectural documents. And then they also create design documents that have additional boundary conditions and corner cases and things that the developers have to worry about. And the QA team goes off and writes test cases. And then they have a requirements traceability matrix to trace the test cases and execution of them back to the requirements. And all of those documents are decoupled. If you change one, you have to manually propagate that change to the others. And you and I both know that manual updating frequently doesn't happen. Um, and, and all of these additional documents are opportunities for big B bugs, opportunities for the three different teams to have different understandings of what it is that's going to be delivered. Specification by example has two documents, requirements document and architectural documents. You don't need additional design documents because specification by example says that requirements must include concrete examples. And as we'll see a little later, that includes the boundary conditions and the special cases. So the developers don't have to go figure those out on their own. And specification by example doesn't need test cases. The requirements are identically the test cases. And that doesn't mean the requirements tell us precisely what to test. It means that we create an interpreter to run our requirements, just like a Python interpreter runs Python programs. So our requirements are executable. We can run them against our system, and they will tell us which ones pass and which ones fail. So why would you write test cases if you can run your requirements? And you sure don't need a requirements traceability matrix because when you run your requirements, you get back a report that's a list of requirements and they're all either green or red. <laughs> it's easy to figure out what that means. So in answer to your question, what if the um, what we're automating is wrong? Well, we're automating the requirements. So if the product owner got the requirements right, then it's very difficult to, to test them wrong because you're literally creating an, an interpreter to run your requirements. It's possible to create bugs there. That is absolutely possible. Um, so you have to be careful. You have to be disciplined as you do this. This should be first rate code, not second rate code. Um, we actually had a case at uh, Raytheon where the customer came back and said, this code doesn't do what it's supposed to. And we were quite surprised and we said, oh, well, it passes all of the requirements. What doesn't work right? And the customer showed us what didn't work right. And we said, well, but that's not what the requirements say. And we showed them the requirements. And they looked at the requirements and they went, oh, you're right. We wrote the requirements wrong. We will be more careful next time. So because the requirements are so unambiguous, the customer looked at it and said, yeah, you're right. We, we wrote it wrong. And yeah, 
you're the, the requirements pass, you wrote exactly what the requirements told you to write, and you ran the requirements against what you wrote, and they passed. So a traditional narrative requirement might begin with a user story. I'm the accounting department. I want all payments that are 14 days late to be charged a penalty. And writing the same requirement using specification by example, we might write given an active customer account. We can't have a late bill unless we have an active customer account and a bill that is 15 days past due. We didn't say more than 14. More than 14 is not concrete. It is not discrete. 15 is concrete and discrete. A bill that is 15 days past due, when the bill is paid, then a um, Mr. Accounting Department or Mrs. Accounting Department, uh, what, what penalty amount do you want? Okay, 5%. And we put it in. Concrete, discrete example. And the developer looks at this and says, when the bill is paid, that's an event that comes to my software and I have to handle it. <clears throat> How do I handle it? Well, the first thing I have to do is test the preconditions. What are the preconditions? Given these preconditions. And if the conditions are met, my software has to produce the desired result then a 5% penalty will be charged. And when we write requirements with concrete examples, it naturally leads us to ask a couple of questions. Are there other important examples that produce different outcomes? Well, yes, 14 days past due is also an important example because that's the last day on which no penalty will be charged. So we would include 14 days as another example. We'll see how to do that a little later. And we also include the exact penalty amount, even though the user story didn't. So the developers have no ambiguity about what they're supposed to produce. And if the developer uses a less than or equal to where they should have used a less than or you know, similar off by one, the QA team isn't writing less than or equal to. They're running the requirement with an interpreter, which takes exactly 15 days and creates the bill and verifies the 5% penalty. So it's very, very difficult for both the developer and the QA team to get that wrong. Um, SBE specification by example says that we have to show all of the important examples. Are there different preconditions which will produce a different outcome from the same when we pay the bill event? Suppose we have different penalties for different amounts of time past due. So how does this help us? Well, I think I think hopefully you're you're beginning to understand. It helps because the requirements are so much clearer. The product owner has much higher confidence that the delivered code will work as expected. Remember those three circles that sometimes overlap? This is shrinking those three circles into one concentric circle. It helps the developers because all of the boundary conditions are listed with concrete examples. And those boundary conditions are exactly what the developer has to code. Every one of those boundary conditions is going to be either a, a case in a case statement or uh, an if else, a, a, a test in an if else statement. It's gonna be in the code. So if we list those things up front, the developers don't have to guess what the product owner intended. 
and it helps the testers because all of the boundary conditions are listed with concrete examples. And those boundary conditions are exactly what the testers have to test. It helps the business analysts because working with concrete examples helps everyone think of additional examples. And if you're doing this collaboratively, as the methodology says you're supposed to, product owner, business analyst, if you have them, developer, QA, getting together and, and figuring out what is the domain about in which we're going to write requirements? What is the language that we're going to use? Do we have customers or do we have owners or subscribers? What is it that we have? What term are we going to use? Let's write a definition for these terms that might be ambiguous. So everyone knows exactly what we're referring to. And then we're going to use that same term consistently throughout our requirements. When we ask questions like, if we have the same action, but we have different preconditions, can we have a different outcome? We think of additional concrete examples. If you've got the QA team there, the QA team is always thinking about unhappy path. And product owners don't always think about those things, nor do business analysts always think about those things. So having the QA people involved when you're writing the requirements is a big benefit. Having the developers involved is a big benefit because they can say, ooh, okay, that's going to be really CPU intensive to code that. Are you sure you want to do it that way? Are you sure you want that capability? And um, for example, at General Motors, we were working on requirements for a, um, a system where if you opted in, General Motors would send driving data where you drove, how fast you drove, what time of day, how hard you hit the brakes, how hard you stepped on the gas. Um, <clears throat> gosh, don't do this if you're driving one of those new Corvette C8s. Um, <laughs> they would send that data to your insurance company and your insurance company would then rate your driving and give you a discount if, uh, if you qualified for a discount. And the product owner said, um, the insurance companies want to know if you're driving late at night and at high speed, because that's more dangerous than driving in the daytime, in the daylight, and even above 60 miles an hour. So the product owner said, if they're driving above 60 and it's between these hours, we want to send a data record back to the database to record that, okay? And one of the developers said, um, or actually I asked, how accurately do we record speed? And the answer was some absurdly precise number. There's no way the, the mechanical parts of the car could be this precise, but it was like 0 0.03 miles per hour or something. And one of the developers said, well, do you want us to send a record when they drop below 60? And the product owner went, yes. And somebody said, well, if they have cruise control set on 60 and they're driving through any kind of a hill, it's going to constantly go above and below 60 miles an hour. You're going to send lots and lots of records back to the, the back end of the database. And the product owner immediately said, oh, my gosh. We'd be paying AT&T a fortune. No, I can't do that. So we immediately figured out how to change the requirements so that the product owner and the insurance company got the data that they wanted, but we didn't spend megabucks with uh, the uh, cellular carrier. It doesn't, doesn't reduce the business analyst or the product owner's work up front. Um, it absolutely reduces the questions after we deliver the requirements. At General Motors, 
about nine months after the business analysts switched to specification by example, they told me that it didn't save them any work up front. And in fact, it might be a little bit more work. But once the requirements were delivered, there were no more questions, no phone calls, no emails, no instant messages, no one walking up to their cube and asking, what does this requirement mean? And they said, we will never go back to narrative requirements because these are so much more precise. And of course, the developers were thrilled. The manual QA team was thrilled too because now they were getting automated tests for the, for, for the release, not, not one release afterwards. Um, how do we write requirements using specification by example? Well, we write requirements in this given when then format. Given these preconditions, when this event happens, then this is the expected result. And that given when then format is called Gherkin. And probably somewhere you can search online and find the amusing story behind why that's called Gherkin. Um, <clears throat> I've heard Aslak tell the story and it's, it's, it's funny if we have time afterward, I'll tell you. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we do is we write a business rule from the user story. So we might have a business rule, bills more than 14 days late will be charged a 5% penalty. Or a business rule, late bills will be charged a penalty on a sliding scale. And then we illustrate the business rule with the gherkin and we illustrate the gherkin with concrete examples. So we might, we've already seen this user story as the accounting department, I want late bills to be charged a 5% penalty. And then we write a business rule. Bills more than 14 days late will be charged a 5% penalty. And we make that business rule the title of a scenario, a requirement in specification by example is called a scenario. And then we illustrate that business rule with the gherkin, given an active customer account and a bill that is 15 days past due, when the bill is paid, then a 5% penalty will be charged. Really, really tough for the developer to create a big B bug if they have this kind of a requirement. Let's look at something a little bit more complicated. As the accounting department, I want late bills to be charged a penalty on a sliding scale. So now our, our business rule is a little, little different. And now we're going to use a scenario outline. A scenario outline is a sketch of a scenario and it is only complete when we provide it with multiple examples. So given an active customer account and a bill that is, and then we have this thing in angle brackets, days past due, and that's a parameter. And we will fill in that parameter with an example from an examples table. When the bill is paid, then a, and here we have another parameter, penalty, penalty will be charged. And then we give the examples. So when our interpreter runs this requirement, it's going to run it once for every row in our examples table. Essentially, it's gonna take our scenario outline and it's going to create a scenario from it using the data in the first row of the examples table and another scenario using the data in the second row of the examples table and just keep going until it gets to the end of the examples table. 
So the first time through, it'll be and a bill that is 14 days past due and a 0% penalty will be charged. And then 15 days, 5%. And now our accounting department says, yeah, but if they're 30 days late, I want to charge them 7%. Okay, so that means 29 days, it's still 5%. Yes. Okay. So we list both of those examples. Really, really tough to misunderstand this. And we're clearly illustrating all of the boundary conditions. And someone is sure to ask, are, do we have any higher penalties for some period longer than 30 days past due? So the goals of specification by example, it's to assure that everybody, all the stakeholders, all the team members have the same understanding of what needs to be delivered. And because this methodology tells us to write the requirements together, we have a much better chance of creating that common understanding to provide precise specifications so that we don't spend our time doing rework and fixing bugs. And these requirements are precise because we have to use concrete examples. And if we also very carefully define our terms and use very clean, consistent, and sparse gherkin, then our requirements are even more precise provide an objective definition of done. Well, our requirements are executable. So we're done when all of the requirements pass. So at Raytheon Technologies, the developers quickly became, I could say spoiled, but I'll just say they became accustomed to having automated tests ready before they finished the code. They ran the tests, if anything failed, they weren't ready to open the pull request. So it's a great definition of done. Automate testing without changing the specifications. Well, our requirements are, are, are identically our test cases. We didn't have to translate them into something else in order to automate them. Provide reliable documentation. Since our requirements are easy to read and they can test themselves, they are reliable documentation. If they're wrong, they're going to tell us that they're wrong. Uh, we don't know whether it's the requirement that's wrong or the system that's wrong, but one of them is definitely wrong. They're not in sync. I know all of you have come into a project where you were given some ginormous manual to read and you were told now, uh, chapter five is, it's kind of out of date. There's a lot of that. Some of it's still right, most of it's wrong. And you're like, which parts? You don't know. This way, you always know whether the requirement passes or fails. And minimize the cost of maintaining our documentation. Well, again, the requirements can test themselves. So the cost of maintaining it is reduced. Hopefully, we changed the requirements before we changed the system. But if the code changed before the requirements did, we, we know exactly where the requirements and the, the code disagree. All right, test automation. This is people tradition, people often think that BDD is a QA process. It's not. It is a development methodology, starting with the business analysts. But there's a great strong component of test automation. One of the goals is to make test automation much, much easier so that we can deliver that automation in Sprint. I told you about the team at GM, the QA team, that went from delivering the automation one release behind the developers, that was a two month uh, cycle, down to two or three days after they got it into an integrated environment. 
and doing it with one half of a person instead of eight people. Part of that is because, um, because you're creating an interpreter. Part of that is from discipline. Um, discipline when you're creating your requirements to be very consistent in the way you write things, to reuse the same words, the same patterns when you mean the same thing so that you have less automation code to write, less interpreter code to write. Dramatically reducing the maintenance cost for our test automation. Um, in Programming 101, our professors taught us to make the upper layers of our program as abstract as possible and to push the implementation details as far down as possible. And we will see how that works. It's abstraction. If you look at a typical automated test case. It is typically automated from a manual test case. And the manual test case says, go to this page on the website, click this button, type this in this field, click that button, check this table in the database, this column, and see if you find this value. That's not abstract. You've got implementation details all through the topmost layer of your program, which means that your maintenance costs are going to be very, very high. If the website changes, you're going to be rewriting tons of test cases and rewriting a lot of automation code. With specification by example, we are writing our requirements in a very abstract way. There is no mention here of page, button, field, database table, there's not even a mention of a website. This requirement applies equally whether you're looking at the website, the mobile app, or the API behind those. So it's very abstract. We're pushing the implementation details further down. And that makes our requirements reusable. If the website changes, the requirement doesn't change. If the details of the API change, the requirement doesn't change. At Raytheon, excuse me just a second. At Raytheon, the developers came to us. We had automated several hundred requirements. And the developers came to us and said, well, we're going to throw out our REST API and switch to a GraphQL API. So sorry, but you're going to have to rewrite all of your automation. And we said, no, we won't. And they said, oh, yeah, because it, it's totally new API. And we said, but don't these requirements still apply? And they're like, oh, yeah, the requirements still apply. But, but the interface is completely different. You're going to have to rewrite all of your automation. And we sat them down and we showed them how our automation worked. And they just kind of looked at us like, wow. And we assigned one person, I think it took one person about two weeks to write a little interface layer to, uh, to hide the difference between a REST API and a GraphQL API from the upper layers of the automation code. And all of our requirements ran again. Not all of them passed, you know, depended on how well the developers had done their job, but they all ran. Very, very small amount of change for our, on our part for a total change in the interface that we were testing. Abstraction allows us to reuse Gherkin. Given an active customer account, we're going to have to write a step definition that tells our automation tool, Cucumber, 
behave, spec flow, whatever it is, tells it how, what code it has to run in order to implement that line. And we're probably going to write lots of scenarios that include a customer account of different types. If we do our job well, we can reuse that same step definition and just pass in active, inactive, expired, whatever you know uh, statuses we have for customer accounts, pass that in as a parameter and reuse all of the code underneath it. If we do our job poorly, if we write poor Gherkin and we write given an active customer account, given a customer account that is no longer active, given a customer account that expired previously, you know, those are three very different sentences. And we're probably going to wind up writing three different step definitions and duplicating code and increasing our maintenance costs. So if we write good Gherkin that is abstract and very, very consistent in the way that it's worded, then we get to reuse it. So in a large body of requirements, a single given statement will typically be reused in anywhere from five to 10% of your requirements. And when you reuse it, there's no new code to write. It's already automated. When the bill is paid, we have to write a step definition. Well, we're gonna have lots of scenarios that pay bills. We've already seen some. And we just reuse the step definition and all of the automation code underneath it. And again, if we do our job well in writing good clean Gherkin, a single when statement will get reused in anywhere from five to 10% of our requirements. Then a penalty will be charged, have to write a step definition then a different penalty will be charged. It's just a parameter into the step definition. And another different penalty will be charged and it's a different parameter into the step definition. Thens don't get reused as often. I've seen typically two to 5% of our requirements will reuse a then. But what you get to is, um, you fairly quickly get to the point where you will be sitting in a meeting and someone will say, well, what does our system do if you do that? And you will say, I, I don't know, but let's write the requirement and see. Because you've got so much automated that you can literally just write a requirement and immediately run it. There's no automation to do, no coding to do. So you run the requirement, and it comes back and tells you what the system does. It's always a great moment when you can do that. And, and the, you see the light bulbs going off around the table, going on around the table, people going, wow, okay, this is powerful. Abstraction also lets us reuse high level helper methods. We, for the first step definition, we may have to write two or three or four helper methods, high level helper methods. For the second step definition, we may reuse a couple of helper methods and require one new one. And, you know, third step definition, fourth step definition, we may be able to completely reuse helper methods, don't have to write anything. So if we write good Gherkin, we get a lot of reuse out of it. If we write clean step definitions, step definition should be at most four or five lines of code, no business logic. Should be basically just calls to high level helper methods. So if we write good clean step definitions, then we can reuse high level helper methods. And if we write good, clean, high-level helper methods, 
then implementation details only appear in the lower level helper methods. And now we can automate more than one interface, the web API, the website, the two mobile apps, and reuse perhaps half of our automation code. What we do is at the very bottom layer of our automation code, we put in a, a class factory. So the high level helper method calls down and says, please give me back a class that implements the pay the bill method. And I was told at runtime that we're going to test through the API. So the class factory then returns a class instance that implements pay the bill and it inherits from your favorite REST API library and it knows how to talk to your API. The very next time you run those requirements, the same high level helper method may call the class factory and say, please give me back a class instance that implements pay the bill. And at runtime, I was told we want to test through the iOS app. The class factory gives it back a class instance that inherits from your favorite iOS tool, maybe Appium, and implements pay the bill. The high level helper method doesn't know what it's got. It just knows I've got a class instance and it's got a pay the bill method and I can call it and it does. So you can reuse tons of automation code across interfaces. That is extremely powerful. I don't know any other methodology that allows you to do that. So additional learning. Well, the first thing is before you Google BDD tutorial, please go read my blog post titled Never Google BDD Tutorial. I was uh, teaching a class once at General Motors and in person, walking around while they were working on exercises in, in small groups. And looking over shoulders, listening to conversations, answering questions. I saw one of the students had her phone open and had, um, had some gherkin on it. And I looked at it and I went, that gherkin is really familiar. Why is that gherkin so familiar? And then I realized it was familiar because it appeared a little bit later in the class in the section titled Bad Gherkin. This student had very cleverly Googled BDD tutorial and had found the same bad websites that I had found. Specification by example is about where Agile was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, perhaps 15% of the companies out there were using Agile and some of them were reporting really, really impressive results. And a lot of companies were experimenting with Agile and doing it really, really badly and reporting on their bad results and telling you how to follow them and doing it badly. Um, I once heard a VP of engineering say, the only thing I have ever seen Agile do is make a project six months late. And I was like, ow, that doesn't sound good. How did, how did they manage that? And I found out later that his team that was using Agile, they had Scrum and they had sprints. Their sprints were three months long. So 
<laughs> you know, they claimed they were agile. They had scrums and they had sprints, but a three month sprint is not anything any agile teacher or coach would ever tell you was acceptable. They would go, no, you're using waterfall. You just got scrum with it. So specification by example is in pretty much the same place today. You've got some companies that are using it really well. BNP Paribas, Vanguard Financial, uh, parts of General Motors, parts of Raytheon, and just really impressive results. And you've got a lot of folks out there who, if you go read their um, blog posts, you'll read about writing test scripts. But I haven't said anything about writing test scripts. We write requirements. Um, you'll find lots of blog posts talking about Cucumber is a great testing tool. The guy who wrote Cucumber, Aslak Helisoy, in one of his blog posts said, if you think that Cucumber is a testing tool, please keep reading because you are wrong. So a lot of misinformation out there, tremendous amount of misinformation. So places that you can go um, to get really good information, um, books, Behavior Driven Development with Cucumber, uh, Richard Lawrence and Paul Rayner, um, very easy to read. Um, some programming examples in Ruby, you do not have to be a programmer to read and understand the book. Um, business analysts, product owners, anybody can read this. Um, specification by example by Goiko Adzik, uh, that's very good, it has no programming in it. It's a lot thicker than behavior driven development with Cucumber. Um, but it's, it's very, very good. Writing great specifications. The Cucumber for Java book. If you are a programmer and you like Java, then that's the book to read. Um, Seb, Matt, and Aslak. And Aslak wrote Cucumber. So that book is authoritative. Um, if you like Ruby, the Cucumber book has examples in Ruby. Um, Websites, my own website, the BDD coach, cucumber.io, now part of Smart Bayer, goico.net, uh, Goico Adzik's website, specflow.org, the guy who wrote Specflow, which is essentially the C sharp version of Cucumber, uh, created that website. All of those are reliable places. So we have time. I can tell you. Um, <clears throat> Aslak was writing Cucumber and he was on the train returning from Norway back to the UK and got to the point where he, he was ready to, to publish it and he turned to his wife and he said I want to create an open source project for this thing I've created but in order to do that I have to have a project name what should I call it? And she said, well, when you run the requirements, you want them to turn green. Green, like a cucumber, so call it cucumber. And he looked at her and he said, well, that's okay for today or maybe for this week. But beyond that, we'll have to come up with an appropriately geeky name for it. So that was... I think about 12 years ago now. And of course, not only did the product get named Cucumber, but his company was named Cucumber Limited. His website is cucumber.io. So the name stuck a lot longer than, than the next week. So now you know, and, and Gherkin, of course, is a small pickle or a small cucumber. So the, the given when then format got its name from that. Questions? All right, I'll start off. Um, so I, I've done some uh, some BDD and some spec work and, and stuff before. Um, personally, I like Spock. Uh, and on the Ruby area, our spec works really well. Uh, JBehave is also another good one in uh, in Java. I don't know about the the JavaScript area, but uh, 
I, there's I, an I, official I, version of Cucumber for JavaScript. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I, I typically see it being used for business logic. I, it works great for stuff like that. How yep. well does it work when you're talking about uh, UX and UI design and, and all of that stuff? I'm like, I, I can go and I can define it in words, right? But how well does that translate to the Cucumber spec file? So um, you're writing requirements. Do your requirements apply to both the website and the API behind the website? Mm, that's okay. That's that's an interesting take then. Um, so let, let me frequently, ask frequently, sure. your business logic is implemented in the back end. Right. So the requirement applies equally to both the API and all of the UIs that use that API two mobile apps, uh, website uh, at General Motors, uh, internal website, customer facing website iOS, Android, the API behind the vehicle's interface to the back end, and the infotainment console in the car itself, another UI. And, and we could write requirements that applied equally to all of those and could be automated against all of those. OK, all right, that, that makes sense. Questions uh, either online anything yet or people here live someone's got to have something oh yeah how does this work with like larger overall system design like um i can see how this works for like these small business requirements like this but when you're talking about say a suite of microservices talking together or that sort of thing um Again, you have a business purpose for that. There's, there's a reason for those microservices. They exist, for example, you have microservices for authentication, user authentication, for role management. And you can write business requirements for role management. And then you can automate those requirements against that API, against the authentication API, against the authentication microservice. Um, same thing, whether it's uh, billing or or um, whatever it is, uh, data science, anything. Ultimately, you can write a business requirement, right? The product owner has a reason for wanting it, that service back there. So you write about that business reason. Okay, uh, and anyone else? This is the quietest we have ever had this. This is insane. That is an awfully quiet crowd. I think I must've done something wrong. Is everyone still awake? Yes. Okay, I hear one person still awake. Seriously, we've got like 20 people here. Everyone else is asleep. So how many of y'all have actually seen or heard something about BDD previously? Raise your hand, I can't. Uh, a so three or four. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is fairly new to most of you. Are most of y'all developers? Everybody, most everybody here is a developer. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, we we had a, a question here. So let okay. me let me read this. Or actually, can can you see that as well? Can you see the questions on your end? Um. No. All right, cool. Uh, I can see the I'll, chat, but not the questions. All right. Uh, what about when individual interactions are complicated? For example, I want to test how a system handles a, diagnost a diagnostic lab order, but there is an enormous amount of detail that could go into submitting such an order. Gherkin seems like it breaks down when a lot of detail is required to transact a particular submission. Great question. Um, it certainly could. So there are two things, two tools that you use to combat that. Um, the simplest is that your requirements, a, a, a entire set of requirements can have a background. So you can say background, and then you can say given this precondition and this additional precondition and this additional precondition, and 
and those apply to every requirement you write in that file. So all of your all of your complicated setup can go in the background. You can also, we didn't talk about uh, data tables, but if you have complicated setup like that, it's very valuable to use a data table and to use Gherkin like, um, given this customer account, let me hang on just a second and I will, Share my screen again. Would you mind increasing the font a bit, Leslie, please? Let me. How's that? Can yeah, people that, read that? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And then you put in a data table. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, anything you need in here, whatever you use that describes customers and customer accounts and um, and that that's always the the first row is the the, the header row. The header the row. Variable yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And then you list out all of the data and and, uh, and and you can have more than one row. I mean, you can have um, <clears throat> you know, and and just keep going. Yep. So that's one way you can handle um, complicated setup. The other way to handle complicated setup is to use a, to to ask your product owner for a higher level abstraction. So um, rather than think of a good example of this, rather than, um, I, I don't have one canned that I typically use for that. Uh, rather than, than, than writing a, um, given a bird and the bird is green and yellow and the bird is less than six inches high and the bird can talk, you write, given a parakeet. You know, that's a higher level concept. So if you have lots of complicated setup, think of a higher level, find a higher level concept that can express it. And then you write a definition for that higher level concept and you use that higher level concept that the whatever word it is for that higher level concept, you use that very consistently in your requirements. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> we'll see okay. if, they, uh, if they get back to us. Um, okay. So that, uh, you know, following up on, on that one. So if you're going to use a higher level um, concept or, or abstraction mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's really important when, when you're doing um, specification by example to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Do you keep a, a legend or a key or something like that with your, your specifications or your examples or, or any of that stuff? What do you recommend? What I recommend is when you are creating requirements, requirements go in a feature file, which begins with the word feature. Um, And then I like to put in anything between here and the back, the first background or the first scenario. Anything in this space is a comment. 
cucumber, spec flow, whatever you're using, just ignores stuff in here. So I put in here, um, so I put in typically a couple of different sections, assumptions and definitions. And then down here we may have And then I, I, I write in here all of the definitions of terms that we're going to use in our requirements so that there's never any doubt as to what those terms mean. And they're, the definitions are right there where we're using them. Oh, uh, we've got a question over here. Um, and I got to remember not to sit in the squeaky chair. <laughs> So going back to that uh, example that you were sharing, mm -hmm. um, where you had the table with all those different rows, mm -hmm. I've done that before in Spock, uh -huh. uh, where in Spock, I would have the when clause or the given clause, the mm -hmm. when clause, the then clause, and then that's a where clause. And this is a question about what is good or bad um, specification by example, practice. Mm -hmm. So in an effort to try to have fewer testing functions in my Spock test, what I would do is one of those columns would wind up being like an expected result, maybe an expected exception that might get thrown or an expected um, Boolean value that I would expect from the result of the when so that I could assert that in the then block. Um, and the question is, is that a bad idea to do in specification by example, to have an expected value that is going to be asserted as part of the where clause. Instead, would I want to have separate methods? So like all the different conditions of data that could result in a particular exception should be in one test. Then all of the um, conditions that could result in a true result should be in a completely separate test. Is it a bad practice to have expected results that are going to be asserted as part of the table of data along would, with, because it, to me, it seemed like it was really clear. If you read the row, you can mm -hmm. see all of the data and then see exactly what you would expect the result to be, whether mm -hmm. it actually, whether the software actually does that or not, that's a different matter. Um, so is that a good practice or is that a bad practice or how does that fit into specification by example as a practice that, that's an that's an easy answer because um none of the tools for automating specification by example allow you to do that anything that's up here cannot be referenced down here so that was a spock specific yes. implementation that allowed me to do that yes Okay. What you would, and but your question about um, happy paths versus unhappy paths, that's what you were asking, right? Right. Yeah. So, what I typically do is I put all of the happy paths up here, and then down here, I put um, And, and that would be, um, this would actually be one of the unhappy paths. We're getting an error message back. So that would be down here in the unhappy paths. So I separate them. 
It just makes it easier to understand. I start with the very, very simple happy path scenarios. Can I create a customer account? Great, I was able to create a customer account. Now let's get a little more complicated and see whether I can edit all of the fields I'm supposed to be able to edit or whether I can um, you know, provide data for all the fields I'm supposed to be able to provide data for, whether it edits the data or you know, um, filters the data properly comes back and says, no, you're not allowed to, uh, to put in an age of negative three. That would be down here in the unhappy paths. So that's the approach I take. Got it. All right, Leslie, we've got a, a question in chat uh, from Michael Van Orman. And I'm going to say, you know what? He basically wrote a novel. So if you can pull that one up, because honestly, I don't feel like reading it. <laughs> in chat, OK. Yeah. Uh, running genetic tests. Um, what do we got? Uh, it starts okay. with, let's dive a little deeper, mm -hmm. blah, 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 yep. Yeah. Michael, if you wanna give a, a, a briefer synopsis <laughs> for, for your question, for those that, uh, that are maybe um, reading it a little bit later or whatnot, that'd be great. Um, yes, a data table with 50 columns is, um, is is uh, not good practice. Um, so the the only choice you have there is to break it down into individual examples where keeping these other forty nine or forty nine columns, we'll say for the moment, the same. If we change this one column, what is the outcome? And, and you have to do that for all of the columns. If you have combinations of columns, it gets really challenging. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to really look at the, the example and talk to the subject matter experts to really understand how you would break that apart. We did some similar sorts of things in some of the data science applications. Um, certainly nothing with 50 columns. So tough, tough problem, good question. The, the best thing to do is to try to break it apart into separable components that you can test. I, you know, I think, I think this brings up a, a good question here, Leslie. Uh, what level of granularity do you want to get when you're writing your specifications and how, uh, how pedantic should I get when, when I'm describing them? One of the data scientists with which I was with whom I was working at Raytheon said, this is the most pedantic thing I have ever done. And it is valuable. So he was talking about it in terms of the level of precision of the language that we were being just incredibly careful in the way we worded these things so that we knew what we we knew ourselves what we were talking about um give me an example you said um how detailed should we be yeah so uh actually i asked a question and then right uh, right about the same time that i asked it uh we had someone else ask a very similar question so let me read that one uh, he says, how fine, uh, how coarse slash fine grained should these specifications be? Any best practices? Some, some feature, for example, may take a day to implement and, an, and another feature could take a month. So should a bigger feature spec be broken down into multiple smaller ones? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I try to group requirements into logical groupings. That's why it's called a feature file, because it's a feature, you know, a feature could be um, <clears throat> the rights of admin users, that might be a feature, or the rights of different, different abilities of users generally. Admin users can do these things, regular users can do those things, super users can do these other things, um, uh, unverified users have a very limited set of things they can do. So 
I would break those up into manageable chunks based on logical groupings like that. If you if you have lots and lots and lots of requirements about each feat, each user type, break them up by user type. If you have three or four requirements for each user type, put them all in one feature file that talks about user capabilities. That makes sense. Um, I, th I think I cut you off uh, where you were asking how uh, how pedantic should uh, should some of these things be. And when you were going through the the example of the uh, the account that's past due, uh, I, I was reading that and I immediately thought, oh well, there there's kind of a a corner case or something that I would want clarified. So if if I remember right, it said given a an account an active account um, when. Let's see. And a bill that is 15 days past yes. you. And a bill that is 15 past days. When the bill is paid, add X amount of um, penalty to it, right? Mm -hmm. So my question on that one, and maybe this is just me being pedantic. So is it is it before it's paid, right? As it's being paid, after it's paid. So they, they pay the bill and then there's another penalty. They have to go back through and pay again. So that, that's one of those nuances that, uh, that I would have. And maybe that's just me being pedantic, but that that's a question. Right, so you would discuss that with the product owner when you're writing the requirements and and figure out the right way to say it. So if the, the product owner says, yes, we're going to send them a separate bill for the additional 5%, then you would write a requirement that, that explained it that way. But um, if it's just an additional 5% added onto the bill, um, and if you needed to, you could say, you know, given a bill uh, $400, then um, $105 will be charged if you, if you needed to be that explicit about it. That makes sense. Um, I have another question if no one else has one. Okay, sure. Um, so stepping out a little bit higher level, I'm sure from the, the hands I saw raised earlier, it sounds like there's a number of people in the audience who are interested in BDD and SPE, but um, their companies currently don't use them. And I'm curious if you have tips for um, how to gain traction or what key stakeholders are good to, to try to get buy-in on first, um, or just any general tips on, on getting started um, beyond the technical aspect of it, more of the, the organizational yeah. aspect of it. And, um, and Goico's book, Specification by Example, about the first third of that is really how do you create change within your company? So um, if you want to know the technical aspects, a third of his book isn't of interest to you. But if you want to understand how to create the change, a third of it is. Um, one of the things that I have learned from, from mistakes, um, is I never ever use the word, the term behavior driven development, except in a class where I explain that's not the right term to use. Because as soon as you say behavior driven development, the business analysts and or product owners say, oh, okay, you're the developers, you can go do anything you want, have fun, knock yourselves out, don't involve us. But if you say specification by example, and I actually did this at General Motors, we had done our proof of concept, we had demonstrated for a brand new website that we had never touched before, we got brand new requirements, we jumped in, we started automating, we delivered the automation before the developers finished coding. Well, my director was obviously very proud of that to get up to the CIO of our vertical. And the CIO was very pleased and said, do that again. So we were asked to do that for the billing and revenue management project for which there were no requirements. And the business analyst said, we don't need to write requirements because it's a replacement. It's just supposed to do what the existing system does for which there are no requirements. And so I sent out an email to everybody and I said, we're going to start writing requirements using specification by example as the methodology. And the manager of the business analyst called me and was very polite, but basically said, why are you writing requirements? That's our job. And, and I said, 
I, I don't want to be the one writing the requirements, but I have no choice. The CIO wants us to deliver the automated tests before the developers finish writing the code. And the only way I can do that is to write the requirements using this specification by example methodology. Meaning, I didn't say this, but meaning if you don't want me to write the requirements, go tell the CIO, which of course wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so, so, so the manager of the business analyst assigned the lead business analyst to come help us. And the lead business analyst was very quickly able to write the requirements using SBE. She's real smart. And she was the one who announced a couple of months later that the business analysts were going to transition from narrative to SBE, and I was going to come train them. So stay away from BDD. That's what it was originally called because uh, Dan North, a developer, uh, came up with it. But Goico created the term specification by example. And ASLAC has said it's a much better term for what we're doing. We're writing requirements. Begin where you are. If you're in the development team, start with the developers. If you're in the QA team, start with QA. And if you have a good friend who's over on the business analyst or product owner side, take them to lunch <laughs> and say, would you like us to... Um, deliver your product without any bugs, it is possible. Here's how we can do it. And, and show them the examples. These are not examples that are, are hidden somewhere. You can go find BNP Paribas and Simon Powers on the cucumber.io blog, um, GM and, and um, Vanguard. Uh, you can find in you know, you've got a recording of my presentation. Um, Raytheon, again, that's that's something I'm allowed to talk about. So these are not mysteries. These are things you can point to and say, here are examples where real companies with real 30 to 40% of their developers' time was spent fixing bugs. When I got to Raytheon, the developers would schedule a release and at the same time they scheduled a release, they would schedule a bug fix release for two weeks later. It's just standard practice. Once I began, once we began de delivering automated tests in Sprint, after we'd done that a few times, the developers went, you know what? I don't think we need to schedule a bug fix release. Does that help? Very good. Yes, yes, it does. All right, we've got another question uh, from one of our uh, our viewers on on Zoom. With powerful front end frameworks like Angular and React, a lot of business logic is coded into front end components, which then call simple back end persistent services. Mm -hmm. How would this methodology be implemented in these cases? So you still write the requirements about business purpose. In that case, you would have to automate them against the UI, and you would not be able to automate those against the API. Um, all of these tools allow you to attach tags to your requirements, and those tags can be anything you want them to be, but one very useful thing to do is to separate the requirements using, using tags into requirements that can be applied to different interfaces. So everything that, that can be applied to the UI, you would tag with UI. And everything that can be applied to the API, you would tag with API. So you're still writing requirements, but you can now only apply them in certain places. They're not automatable against every interface out there. All right. Um, any other questions for people? And Don, if uh, if that answered your question, or if you've got a follow up, uh, feel free to to further clarify or ask again. I thought I had a question that was like 10 minutes ago and it's gone. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Um, 
Any anything else from the audience over here? Anyone? Anyone? No. All right. Uh, let me see if I can jog my memory real quick and mm -hmm. remember my question. Um, what was I looking at? Oh shoot. Hmm. Nope, it's gone. So I think that should cover it, I guess. Any, so uh, we're, we're talking about uh, SBE. Does anyone have any question? Oh, Don's got a follow up? Yeah, he just needs to formulate it. Okay. Type faster, Don. <laughs> I will say it is great fun the first time you deliver automated tests in Sprint and you see the light bulbs turning on and people going, wow, I know you told us you could do this, but I didn't believe you could do this. I've never seen anybody do this. This is awesome. And then if you're not in the, if for example, if you're in the QA team, the developers are suddenly going, could I get that? Can I, can I get your automation and run it myself? <laughs> And you're going, darn straight you can. That's what I'm wanting you to do. Now will you help me write the requirements too? Um, it's it's so much fun when that happens. It is a great feeling, great achievement. Looks like Don's writes some, writing some stuff out, but we're not quite there yet. And I actually remember my question. So those, those that are either online or, or here, uh, if you remember a few years ago, uh, I believe this is when Java 8 came out and we had JUnit that was there, the, mm -hmm. there was a bug where the, the order in which tests were called in JUnit actually changed and it screwed up a whole bunch of stuff, right? Depending on when, when your test was called in, in the, uh, the hierarchy, some things may have already been um, asserted or maybe mm -hmm. you had stuff that was done in a setup method that wasn't called or you had some artifact that was bleeding through um, other, other parts of a test. Um, does that matter in SBE? when things are called or if you can introduce chaos by kind of switching things up uh, as far as when those particular scenarios are uh, are being called well it could matter but um all of the good uh training materials on specification by example teach you that every scenario should be completely independent of every other scenario the given should describe all preconditions necessary for this requirement to be met. Nothing should be left out. If you do that, then it does not matter in what order you run the requirements. It does not matter whether certain requirements have not been run or have been run. Um, none of that is going to change the requirements that follow because they all specify they're given entirely. That is very, very good practice. It's an anti-pattern to, um, to not specify your givens, your preconditions completely in a scenario. All right, very good. Looks like Don's done talking. So I'm going to uh, try and form this into a, a question. It's kind of a, a multi-part thing, uh, but mm -hmm. he's talking about, uh, you know, Angular and, and React and, and other front-end frameworks that all have powerful component testing features. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of those, the, the services or features are mocked out when, when you're using them in a testing scenario. So mm -hmm. he's asking, first off, is mocking in an SBE uh, situation, is that an anti-pattern? And two, uh, because UI tests are one expensive, two flaky, I, is there is there a way to minimize their use or to kind of obfuscate them when you're doing uh, SBE? So um, mocking is not an anti-pattern. Obviously, the the desirable goal is to test against the real system, not against a mock of of parts of the system. But certainly, if you're testing against some outside, there's some you've got a federated system. So you're querying the insurance company to get back the rate for the, you know, whatever. Um, it probably makes good sense to mock that. You don't want to be waiting a long time for them to reply. 
you don't really care what the number coming back is. That's not the purpose. That's not what the requirement talks about because you don't write the rules that set the rates. They write the rules that set the rates. You're just getting a number back and you're applying it. So I would absolutely mock things like that. Um, <clears throat> so you mock where you need to. Obviously, the less you have to mock, the better off you are because you're testing more authentically. Um, UIs, of course, are always slower, slower to write, slower to run. They change more frequently, driving up your maintenance cost. So you try to avoid those. Everything you can test at the API level, test at the API level. If it's implemented in the UI, in React or whatever, then clearly you have to test it through the UI. But that does not mean that you have to test all of it through the UI. You only have to test those parts that are implemented there. So um, I, I tell people that um, remember that if the UI for the portions of the UI that are that use the model view controller um, paradigm, why you only need a couple of tests. You need to verify that you can write data back there. You need to verify that you can read data from the back end. You need to verify that you can control what the back end did. That's all you got to verify through the UI. There's business logic. Yeah, you got to verify that. Um, All right. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. So we, we've had sure. a couple of people that said uh, they, they've heard of uh, BDD or S, uh, SBE. Uh, so the majority of the people, it looks like, are not familiar with it. And you've given some examples of Cucumber and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But do you have a, a demo that kind of walks you through what it all looks like, any of the code behind files, um, steps that, that are implemented in code, and, and how that what that bridge is with the the cucumber or the sorry not the cucumber the the gherkin and then the code that's actually run yes i do have that give me a moment here to see um let me yeah they're not there give me a moment to find what i need Okay. Um, okay. Um, test automation, beginning with the requirements, there, there are distinct layers. You've got the Gherkin, You've got the step definitions that we've already talked about. You've got the high level and low level helper methods. And then you've got the libraries under that. Selenium, Appium, whatever you need to use. Um, oh. Here is what a step definition looks like. You've got your Gherkin given an active customer account. Your step definition is a a tag at given or a decorator <clears throat> and a regular expression. In this case, our regular expression is a literal string, an active customer account. And attached, these, these are all stored as text files, right? These are stored as text files. This is a this is part of a program. It's a Python file or a, a Java file or whatever, you know, whatever your language is. Um, it's, a, it's a program. It's part of your program. That's a decorator in your program. We'll see the code a little bit later. 
and attached to that decorator is the actual function or method that gets called when the interpreter sees given an active customer account. So if we're using Cucumber, in this case, um, I'm gonna show Python examples. Where, so we would be using behave, but call it Cucumber. Cucumber sees given an active customer account. It goes and looks for a regular expression that will match given an active customer account. When it finds that regular expression, it runs that function or method. That's how it matches them up. So given an inactive customer account, you could do it this way, but now you've got two step definitions. So the better way to do it would be given a, you know, some type of customer account. And then you would have code that would create an active or inactive customer account. And then of course you would actually really put a capture group there in your regular expression so that you could capture, is it active or inactive? And you could pass that into this function that's being called. Um, and that's why we emphasize that our Gherkin should follow, we should reuse the same pattern every time we're talking about the same thing. So here now we actually have a capture group and we it will accept, it will match either active or inactive. And then we have the code. Um, and if we have other types of customer accounts, we would just put those in there. And now we've given that capture group a name account type. And now in Python, we're defining a function called, we named it similarly to our Gherkin, an account type customer account. We pass in the context object and we pass in this account type that we captured. And then we call a high level helper method called create customer account and we pass it the account type. And we get back an account ID and we store that on this context object that we're gonna pass, uh, pass down through our step definitions. Uh, let's see. And yeah, put your step definitions into three blocks, put your givens together, your whens together, and your thens together. It just makes it easier to find what you're looking for. Um, let's see, where do we need to go from here? Um, high level helper methods, low level helper methods. Here are high level helper methods. So no implementation details there. Put business logic in them. Let's find some actual. Okay, here's an actual step definition. Um, given an active customer account, define a function called step implementation. The context object is always there. We're just, just going to raise a not implemented exception. First thing to do, create a stub, raise a not implemented exception. Um, and then the next thing we need to do is we need to add an implementation. And so we're going to collect some account attributes and 
create an account with those account attributes and we're going to save the account ID because we're going to need it a bit later. And then we would add dummy definitions of the high level methods, collect account attributes or create account. Um, let's go on down and see. Um, um, data tables, how we automate those. Well, data tables behave assumes that all data tables have titles. Cucumber does not make that assumption. So given these books in our catalog, and um, we, well, if you don't know Python, but basically you, you can um, address that data table. You can look at row zero and get all of the headings and, um, and then look at the succeeding rows and pick up all of the data. Let's see, yeah, we've already talked about that. Does that help? I didn't get down into quite a lot of detail there, but I, I think I showed enough to, to show you how you step down through that. Yeah, yeah, I think, okay. I think that helps. Uh, any any other questions here from the audience or online? I know we're, we're getting close to time. Nope, all right, well then. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for uh, for being with us. We appreciate it. Uh, who who we got next month again, Jonathan? All right, Brian Slutton is coming next month, and he is talking about machine learning, WebAssembly, and IPFS. And it will also be a uh, an AMA style uh, after his uh, his uh, his presentation as well. So I think what we will do is we will go through and raffle off some stuff. And the way that uh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do these first. Kate, you want to come hand these out to whomever wins these ones? So let's do this first one. I'm going to go ahead and one. drop off. Okay, great. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Take a look at the website. You'll find more info there. Enjoyed it. Thank you all. Good questions.